always nice to have you join us. This is Platform. I'm Ruth Aguela. It is the third arm of government, but if it fails, it affects the other two arms. I'm talking about the judiciary. An effective criminal justice system, you agree with me, is one of the key pillars upon which the concept of the rule of law is built because it serves as a functional mechanism to redress grievances and bring violators of social norms to justice. And how well a country manages its criminal justice system affects its overall governance performance index. When there is a breakdown in the criminal justice system, it leads to high state of insecurity and poor investor confidence. The justice system in Nigeria, despite laudable reform efforts over the years at the federal and state levels, continues to face multiple challenges. To sustain administration of criminal justice reform is inevitable if the rule of law must thrive effectively and efficiently. There must be thrust in the administration of justice system, a system that will boast of swift services for all, irrespective of status, a system where the law will be administered and served by honest, efficient and intellectually sound judiciary and the bar. To initiate these reforms in the justice sector, there is the need for structural changes in the administration of justice. I'm talking about responsiveness of the justice system to propel social justice. Now, this is hinged on improving governance, accountability, transparency and the promotion of access to justice. The 2023 Nigerian Bar Association Annual General Conference has as its theme, Getting It Right, Chatting the Course for Nigeria's Nation Building. The aim is to galvanize lawyers to effectively play their role in building a nation that, we'll all, that we will all be proud of. In line with that, our focus on platform is reforms in the justice sector. And our guest is Professor Yemi Akinsheye George, SAN. He's the president of the Center for Socio Legal Studies. Thank you so much for joining us, Prof. Thank you very much, Ruth. Thank you. It's a pleasure. This is your first time on platform. Yes. We're well, pleased to have you. Thank you. And just before we bring in our panelists, we'll take you through Professor Akinsheye's profile. He is a visiting professor at Afe Babalola University, that is Aku Adoekiti, and Thomas Adeumi University, Kwara State. He's a fellow of the Davis Center, Princeton University, New JC, USA, and co founder of the New York of University Legal Aid Institutions that introduced the audacious reform to legal education in Nigeria. He has served as special assistant to three attorneys general of the Federation. I told you earlier that he's the president for Center of Social Legal Studies, um, which championed the development of the Administration of Criminal Justice Act that was in 2015 in conjunction with Legal Defense and Assistance Project. The law has now been replicated in various states of the country. A recipient of several merit awards, he has served as chairman of several committees of the NBA, Unity Bar and National. Um, he is also a member of the Rules Committee of the Court of Appeal and the FCT High Court. He has to his credit more than 100 publications, including books, articles and monographs. His currently serving as the chairman NBA Rule of Law and Human Rights Committee. Once again, welcome, Prof. Very impressive, your profile. In fact, we had to, you know, um, edit a lot of things. Excellent Very editing, impressive. yes. Thank you. Our panelist <coughs> on platform is our judiciary correspondent, Austin IMB. Austin, thank you so much for joining us on platform. Thank you for having me. All right. Prof, reforms in the justice sector. You've been part of it a couple of times over the years. And this is something we've seen successive governments since 1999 coming to try, um, you know, to see that reform happen in the justice sector, um, judiciary if you want to put it. But from your perspective and what you have also contributed over the years, um, the trials that didn't work out and the ones that were able to be streamlined, what will be your opening remarks regarding that. Thank you very much, Ruth. <clears throat> Justice sector is the heartbeat of democracy. Mm. As rightly pointed out in your opening uh, statements, when the stakeholders of democracy, the stakeholders of the country, mm. the citizens, 
the politicians and the electorate, everyone yeah. agrees to prioritize matters of justice, then democracy will be put on the right footing and then we're ready to make progress. It is the justice system that is sometimes referred to as the rule of law that protects all of us. Yes. Those who currently hold power at any point in time must always remember that any investment in the justice system is an investment in development. It's an investment in the protection of all, including they themselves. I remember a few, some office holders who are currently being held. You know, when they were in office, they thought that um, they can afford or they could afford to ignore or disobey orders of court. Now the same court are being approached to come and secure their liberties. Hmm. You know, what I'm saying in effect is that politicians in the, are in the executive, do, you know, dominate the executive. Politicians dominate the legislature. They must allow the judiciary to remain independent because the judiciary exists to protect everyone, to protect the executive, protect the legislat uh, legislature, protect the masses, protect business, protect women, protect the vulnerable, protect the young. So the judiciary remains the only independent apolitical organ of government. And for democracy to be sustained in a real sense of the word, we must ensure that we have a clean judiciary, hmm. a strong judiciary, a respected judiciary, a judiciary that enjoys the backing of the public. I like the fact you mentioned a respected judiciary because yes. over time we have seen abuse of power yes. and um, also the rule of law you've mentioned which is not respected in certain stratas. But let me leave it there so Austin will come in. Austin, take it up from there. Okay, thank you. Uh, Ruth. Um, if you, we talk about rule of law, the independence of the judiciary is key. Uh, would you say that uh, in Nigeria now we have uh, an independent judiciary? that can do justice to the rich and the poor? I will say yes and I will say no to that same question at the same time. To the extent that the great majority of our judges, great majority, are well, high, are highly qualified, to the extent that most of them are excellent lawyers, knowledgeable in the law, to the extent that, you know, the judiciary is not put under pressure. Hmm. And that's, you know, I mean, that goes to, you know, matters that, not, that are non-political. You see, you, when you want to see the brilliance of our judiciary, go to matters that are non-political. But the moment we come into the political terrain, we find so much pressure on our judges. So heavy pressure mounted on judges by the political elite because of their desperation for power. You know, so we need to insulate the judiciary from pressure, hmm. especially political pressure from the ruling class. And that's why I, I, I love the approach, uh, I mean the declaration of the incumbent government. You know, the president was speaking at the Bar Association Conference, yes. which is ongoing, yeah. which is one of the largest gathering of lawyers in, in the continent. He said the issue of welfare of judges, their salaries, yeah. their conditions of service, mm. you know, and everything that conduces with their independence, anything that supports their independence, will be given, will be treated as a matter of priority. And the Attorney General, incumbent Attorney General, Mr. Latif Fagwini, also reiterated the same thing. I know them. I mean, the, when, Including when, the issue of financial autonomy? Including the issue of financial autonomy. Because the judiciary must be financially autonomous. Hmm. And financially autonomous but accountable. I was going to say that. Financially autonomous uh -huh. but accountable. Yes. We cannot have and transparency. Uh, yeah, and transparent. Okay. And transparent. You know. So I think it's a it's a step in the right direction, but it should not be mere talk. We've had so much talk over the years. 
about improving the salaries of judges. Some, many judges have been on the same salary scale for close to 15 years or more, depending on how long you have, you know, each of them uh, you know, has been in office. This is, this is an, and this is in violation of the Constitution. Because the Constitution says that judges' salary cannot be altered, cannot be reduced. But we have inadvertently reduced their salaries by keeping them on the same salary scale, despite the fact that inflation, inflationary trends, and the decline in the value of the Naira, all of this have eaten the value okay. of, 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 of their pay. The, um, Prof, yes. if I get you correctly, I know um, the welfare is just one aspect of the challenge. Yes. But that's not to say if we're looking for responsiveness in the justice system to propel just um, social justice, yes. we won't also touch other gray areas. Absolutely. Now, the goal is to have a robust judicial system, you know, that would expedite and actually make affordable justice accessible to everyone. Yes. Aside the welfare aspect, which is, I'm not saying it's not important, yes. what other areas, you know, should we begin to look at? Because if these reforms must happen, then you must start nipping the problems in the pot. Particularly in the area of aut automation of uh, the justice sector. I surely agree with you. When we talk about welfare, welfare is not about salary. It's not only about salary. Hmm. Welfare is tends to working conditions. It's encompassing. It, it, it's, a, it's all encompassing. Yeah. For example, it is an embarrassment that... A country as civilized as Nigeria continues to allow our judges to write proceedings in longhand, which is one of the reasons why our courts are congested. Now you're talking about automation. Infrastructure. Automation. Okay. Mm. I'm talking about mm. infrastructure. Mm. Yes. I'm talking about infrastructure. We now have in place, and I'm, 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 I'm happy to say that our center, Center for Social Legal Studies, has provided with the support of our, of our development partners you know, we, uh, like the MacArthur Foundation, we have helped to equip some courts with e-recording facilities such that judges no longer, in those courts, judges in those few courts, no longer have to take proceedings in long hand. All they, need to, all they do is just watch proceedings. Hmm. And everything is recorded, and then, uh, and then a, a voice is transmitted to test. And then transcripts can be produced. There's, there's verbatim recording of everything that goes on in court with minimal editing. A Nigerian uh, devised technology. Hmm. In other words, we don't have to Im depend upon imported technology, imported software. The Nigerian, the firm of Fumi Kodri and Co., has developed software called QSoft De Novo, which many judges are enjoying now. I think there should be an ultimatum set for all courts in Nigeria, including magistrates, to go digital. Okay, uh, let me take yes. you here. Cost of litigation yes. on, and uh, maybe technical rules are some of the issues that uh, hinder people from having access to justice in Nigeria. Yes. Oh. What uh, do you think should be done in area of promoting uh, alternative dispute resolution so that people don't need to go to court or the time to resolve their problem? Because adding to that, the delays in court it cases, also a people see their cases linger. Prof, you agree with me on that? Absolutely. For years. One of the headaches of our justice system is delay. Mm -hmm. We must address the issue of intractable delay. Look, justice delayed is justice denied. denied. Yes. At the same time, justice hurried is justice denied. Hmm. Yeah. So that's why we talk about trial within a reasonable time. Yeah. In other words, there must be a balance. At the moment, the, 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 the scale tilts towards excessive delay. And that's why we have complaints from the members of the public. You go to court, you don't know when you're, you are coming out of the court, especially when your matter goes on appeal. Our appeal courts, especially the Supreme Court, has become a place where cases are delayed. In fact, there are people who go there for the nuisance value, just for the purpose of delaying uh, justice. You know, so, and, and I know, and I know that, I'm very confident, you know, and we continue to work with them, with the government, and, you know, I'm part of civil society, to encourage them to, to set deadlines for conclusion of case of, of trials. We've done it successfully with respect to election cases. It has been done with respect to election cases. If that can be done for election cases, there's no reason why commercial cases, criminal trials, can also not be time bound, cannot be subject to uh, limitations of time. A situation where trials are allowed to go on ad infinitum, indefinitely, reduces public confidence in the administration of justice. And that contributes to some of the insecurity that we have in our country. Some people now have recourse to violence because they, they are not able. Of course, recourse to violence is never justified. But when justice 
is not delivered promptly, speedily, expeditiously, people lose confidence in the justice system. Investors only go where they feel their capital, their capital is protected. If they come here, in fact, we don't need to beg investors. In money, capital goes where it is protected. Exactly. So I, I agree that we need to, to prioritize the issues of justice. So it's not just about welfare. It's about, it's about working conditions. It's about setting standards. And, and making the justice system to be accountable. The Independence of ADR, ADR, as I mentioned. ADR is, also, is part of the justice system. But what, what we find is that a lot of our ADR system now end up in court. When you say ADR, break it down. Alternative the layman. dispute. Uh, 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 you people are speaking in legal terms. <laughs> exactly. Okay, you so know, there's what we call alternative down. dispute resolutions, okay. you know, which includes things like uh, negotiation out of court, mediation, uh, arbitration, you know, conciliation. You know, these are processes that are recognized by our tradition, our traditional justice system. And they have now been incorporated into the modern justice system. So we need to encourage ADR, a lot of ADR, and that has already been done. But we cannot do away with the court system because there are many issues that are not amenable to the ADR process. Many issues. Because there's allegation that some lawyers yes. don't want it. No, no. Because they will not be paid. No, no, no. ADR does not take away the payment of, of, of lawyers. ADR does not take away the lawyer's payment. Because you, before you get into a matter, you have discussed a fee with your client. Yeah. What your client wants is a smooth and expeditious resolution, okay. either within the court or outside the court. You know? so, but if the court system provides strong backing for the ADR system, because there are times you need the court to support the ADR processes, so that when people go to court to challenge the ADR process, the judges will say no. You have submitted to that process. Go and be part of that process. You know, yes. it brings us, Prof, to um, the aspect of capacity building. Yes. Um, because at the opening of the MBA conference, the president talked about attitudinal change um, and the approach. Yes. You know, he was speaking, an approach to governance. Yes. He was speaking to the lawyers. Um, where, because of what Austin just mentioned, when you have um, that laid back attitude, from the legal practitioners because of certain um, requirements that will not be provided at the end of the day. Um, is that, should that be the case? If we're talking about reforms in the justice system, it should be all encompassing um, your commitment, sacrifices you make. I'm not saying you do your job because you're not going to get anything, but that aspect of administration of justice must go beyond that line of placing certain requirements before justice is served. Ruth, this observation you have made is highly pertinent. And that's why I commend most of our judges. Let me tell you, although people talk about judicial corruption and so on, but the great majority of the judges are still free from corruption. The great majority of them. You know, but unfortunately, unfortunately the few bad eggs are given a bad name bad to the majority. The judicial, yeah. So the process of recruiting judges very, very important. The quality of judges, very, very important. So when we're talking about improving administration of justice, we must make the process of appointment of judges transparent. There are good people from all over the country. Lawyers don't feel good appearing before judges who either don't know their law or are not committed to the work. But when you are going before a good judge, you are very happy yeah. because you know that you can talk, you can discuss law. You know, so the, the process and, and let me tell you, even those judges' salaries have not been, you know, judges have not been properly taken, off, uh, taken care of. A lot of them are so committed. By 9 a.m., most of them are seated in their courts dispensing justice. And some sit for up to 4, a, 4 p.m. Some sit up to 5 p.m. because of the pressure, because mm. of the demand. Do get, yeah. You know, they remain committed. They have not said because our salaries have not been up to updated, you know, and all of that will not do our job. No, they are doing their job. But what we are saying is that we can strengthen, we can encourage them, we can make them happier because they exist not for themselves, but for all of us. Yes. The judiciary exists to protect all of us, yeah. to protect commerce, yeah. to protect the economy, to protect even the law enforcement personnel because they are, they are not allowed to do certain things without approval by the courts. And when, for example, the fight against corruption. You know, judges are very central to the fight against corruption because our law does not allow anybody to be convicted without going through a, a, a trial process. If judges are not happy, 
you know, and you are asking them to try cases involving billions of computers ah, I was going when to... they, are, they are not, you know. So all of these things are very important. Prof, I was going to ask yes. you, talking about the fight against corruption. Yes. Uh, we have two agencies of government, the EFCC, ICPC, yes. saddled with the responsibility of fighting corruption. Yes. Do you, what, what do you say? Do you think they have achieved any remarkable success since uh, they came to be? The ICPC and the EFCC have prevented our societies from degenerating into a jungle hmm. since their inception. You can imagine if we don't have the ICPC. You can imagine if we don't have the EFCC. Organized crime will have taken over the system. In fact, the economy will have collapsed by now. But the mere fact that these organizations exist still instill some little fear, some fear, at least in, in public officers. Look at, even notwithstanding the existence of this organization, you can hear the humongous sums being looted from the treasury. Hmm. You know, so these organizations are very important. And we must not toy with their independence. I've had some talk recently about uh, unbundling and so on. People just use words without considering those words. When you talk about unbundling, what do you mean? Rather than talking about unbundling, talk about strengthening these agencies. Yes. Give them power to be able to do asset recovery. Building capacity. Not just about, of course they can investigate, they should investigate, they should prosecute, but they need to be strengthened. Because people have taken advantage of the weaknesses in the public service. Politicians continue to exploit the weaknesses. Even civil, a lot of civil servants exploit the weaknesses in the system. You know, so we need the strong anti-corruption agency, uh, anti agencies. And these anti-corruption agencies should not only be, you know, at the level of a statutory uh, creation, mm -hmm. they should be constitutionalized. They should be written into the constitution. The independence should be guaranteed. You know, we have countries like Singapore and some other countries, unless our country takes the fight against corruption seriously, judiciary, uh, 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 democracy will soon, will soon, will soon collapse. Uh, recently, you convened a meeting, I understand, that I brought together lawyers and um, investigators. Yes. Because of um, Nigerians are not happy. You recover proceeds of crimes. And how do you manage those proceeds? So what becomes of those proceeds at the end of the day? Austin, this is a very good question you have asked. <laughs> you know, and I'm, I've recommended, and I'm, I'm happy that um, some authorities are you know, looking at it. We have at the stage of the anti-corruption fight, the next phase of the anti-corruption fight in Nigeria should be asset recovery and management. Hmm. Effective, look. Part of the problems that this government has now is that there's so much idle money in circulation. People are hiding money. You know? So, the way to, to one of the ways you can fund this economy is to ask questions. Ask the banks. Mm. All of these huge deposits running into billions. You know? Idle funds. Funds, in fact, we need to start to look into the issue of asset recovery. And not just asset recovery, effective asset management. Okay. And the anti-corruption agencies, as we speak, need to begin to build capacity to be able to implement the POCA, the Process of Crime Act, Act. Mm -hmm. which was enacted in 2022. 2022. It's, a, it's a virgin law. You know, recently the EFCC has begun training their personnel on process of crime, and I'm happy that our organization is partnering with the EFCC to do that. You know, and uh, I know the ICPC is also beginning to train their personnel. The focus, the, 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 the priority of this administration, which I, I think they need to come clearly you know, on, you know, they need to come out clearly on this aspect of their prioritization. What do you want to do about recovery of the humongous assets that are hidden in different parts of the country? Okay, in the banks and, and in various instruments. So asset recovery ought to be, asset recovery and management ought to be an important priority of this administration. And what I'm even going to ask you now is also in line with that. Yes. Because when you're um, fighting whatever it is, whether it's corruption or you're trying to create your reforms in one angle, then you should go and look at other areas that you think will be an obstacle to it. That's right. Now, there has been objections, you know, in the past about alleged interface um, from the executive to the judicial um, functions. Tell us from your perspective, what is the contention that has been the case that ought not to be? You see, you are talking about the relationship between the arms of government. Yes. And like the non-interface that should not happen. You mean non-interference? Yes. Um, that's why we are talking about independence of the judiciary. And that's why we are talking about quality of appointment. There is no way that politicians will not always attempt. Not only politicians, money bags. You know, people will always attempt to influence judges. 
They will attempt to interfere with the judiciary. They will attempt it. However, if you have a solid judiciary, a judiciary that is well structured, well provided for, you know, with their support staff, because another way judges can be influenced is through their support staff, many of whom are not even lawyers, registrars, clerks of court, their drivers, their orderlies, and so on and so forth. You know, so we, we, we need to protect the judiciary. Democracies like um, India, like, like the Indian democracy, in India, the judiciary has successfully stabilized that country's democracy. And Nigeria, the, Nigeria is, the Nigerian judiciary is also providing support for, for example, look at the presidential election. It's before judges. So we need to take good care of judges. We need to invest in the judiciary. You know, I, I believe that very much. Because when the political branches are misbehaving, and they, will, they are expected to misbehave, because that's the nature of politics. Politics is very, it's, it's always uh, uh, tough, always, uh, te you, know, um, you know, full of competition. You are trying to exclude people and all of that. That's expected of executive arm, expected of, uh, of the legislative. <laughs> it's normal. But the judiciary now remains neutral, remains apolitical, remains independent, remains strong. So that when the excesses of the other arms of government are brought before them, they can look in their, in their face and say, no, you are wrong. This is what you ought to do. So that is why uh, all of the reforms that government is talking about, unless we prioritize and strengthen independence of the judiciary, okay. we, we may not achieve so much. Okay, Prof, you, like my colleague just said, rightly laid the foundation, um, the reforms we're talking about is encompassing. Yes. And we're talking about reforms in the police force. Yes. Reforms in the correctional service. Yes. And so on and so forth. Before the last administration uh, quit, the, there was an amendment where correctional service was taken from the exclusive list to concurrent list. Yes. Which means that administration of that is going to be saddled with the state and uh, the federal, and federal government. Yes. Now, wh wh what do you think will happen, understand, under this uh, arrangement? I think it's, uh, not, it's an excellent um, tinkering hmm. with the power structures of the Constitution, whereby states that are capable, states that, that are financially strong enough, can invest. You see, you find that most of our correctional uh, centers hmm. are populated by offenders who are convicted under state offenses. You know, so, and then our correctional service facilities, service centers, are not able to perform their reformatory functions. Pri uh, prisons or correctional centers do not merely exist to, to punish people, lock people away. No. People are supposed to go there and be reformed and then rehabilitated. You know, and then you know, reintegrated you know, uh, to the, with the society. Right. But at the moment, they are not able to perform that function because of the excessive population of awaiting trial persons. Awaiting trial persons are individuals who have not had their day in court, who have not been tried, but are being held while their trial is, is, uh, is, is, being, awa is being awaited. And the numbers yes. are alarming, Prof, because a survey conducted by um, an NGO was saying that 70% of persons who are in these correctional centers are just languishing there yeah. without trial. trial. Without yeah. trial. And 90% of these correctional centers are overstretched. Yes. And this is a reform that has been uh, a talk for, for very, the reform. For a very long yes. time. That has been ongoing for a very long time. Absolutely. Why is it still being stalled? Thank you very much. The, you see, Reform in the justice sector is not as easy as reforming other sectors like construction. You want to build a road, you simply call contractors, you do a proposal, and mm -hmm. people start building. In six months, you can build a road. Have 100 kilometer, 200 kilometer, 300 kilometers if you have the resources and you are, you are ready to do it. That's called tangible infrastructure. You can build houses, build bridges, construct railway, uh, railways, and all of that. But when it comes to the justice sector, the infrastructure is intangible. And yet, it is the foundation of the tangible infrastructure that we are building. It involves, for example, you talked about the police, you talk about the correctional service, you talk about the courts, you talk about witnesses, you talk about the public, you talk about uh, complainants. So, so there's a whole range, actors, whole range, broad, a broad range of actors involved in bringing about change in the justice sector. Let me hold that thought there, Prof. Yes, we have to take this break. Just okay. hold the thoughts. We'll be back. Please stay tuned. What are we doing as a nation to first of all settle our teeming populace, especially the NTA's political package with a third eye on the nation's political scene? I am Fisa Welcome. 
You have to be very careful giving space to people who are obviously sponsored to, to further the agenda of some other groups. Please remember. A lot of questions. A lot of questions in a closed door sessions. Some of these issues, some of the problems bedeviling the of their In fact, between June 1st and July 17, 19 point something billion has left the coffers of the NDDC. I can say my constituency, they need everything. Because we don't have anything. Welcome back. Thanks for staying tuned. The conversation is still reforms in the justice system. Prof, you were just um, going to conclude your thoughts about the infrastructure and the synergy that must happen in all that strata. You, you've used the right word, synergy. Yes. And that's what is missing. Okay. There must be a harmonious flow hmm. from the public, who are the complainants, to the investigators, to the prosecutors, to the courts, to the correctional service, back to the public. Mm. It's, 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 it's a chain, yeah. but that chain is broken at many, at many points because of inadequate coordination. And that's why we have the Administration of Criminal Justice Monitoring Committee. Unfortunately, that committee somehow, at a point, was doing well, but there was a change of button. You know, you know uh, we are yet to even resolve the issue of the leadership of the Administration of Criminal Justice Monitoring Committee. Hmm. It's very urgent, and I expect that the new Attorney General will prioritize that issue. Okay. You know, and I know the Minister of Justice is also looking into that. We need to quickly revamp the Administration of Criminal Justice Monitoring Committee, which is a coordinating body that brings together all the actors in the justice system. You know, the judiciary, the, 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 ju the judiciary and the, uh, the executive, Minister of Justice, and then non-state actors, civil society organizations are all involved. Anti-corruption agencies are all represented in that committee. You know, it is when the ACGMC is working well that we will begin to see a reduction, hmm. a reduction in the population because they all meet, all the stakeholders meet at that level. So when there's a problem, when the prosecutors are having a problem with the police, they can inform the commissioner, and, they, you know, and then actions can be taken. You know, so we, we, I agree with you that it's, an, it's embarrassing that we have been talking about uh, the congestion of a uh, correctional facility for so many years, the population continues to grow. And uh, it's uh, still uh, growing. It's, it's, it's still growing because of, in a, because of lack of synergy, lack of uh, 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 proper coordination. The attorney general, the buck ends on the table of the attorney general. For Prof, me, let, let, me, yes. let me let me let me cut you here. Yes. Now, recently in yes. Lagos, yes. within the premises of the Federal High Court, uh, the DSS operatives and the that of the Correctional Service, yes. they engage themselves yes. in the show of shame. Yes. Are you now saying that there is disharmony among these operatives, different bodies in the judicial sector? That show of shame that you talked about over the former governor of CBN when uh, the correctional service people were trying to forcefully take him away from the DSS was of most unfortunate. That's a good illustration of the lack of synergy in the system. These are all agencies working for the same government, fighting themselves publicly. And the reason they are doing that is because of the individual involved, not because of the love of the country. Because this is an, you know, a lucrative, a lucrative uh, if you permit me, and that's, that's, that's your opinion. No, no, that's a fact. Okay. That's a fact. Do Go they ahead. do that with respect to other defendants? Yes. Hmm. Won't they allow the court to even rise and then sign the uh, warrant, the warrant for release? Do, do, do correctional, is it not the, the, the people who bring a suspect to court, then who would take the uh, detention order and then go hand them over? Why, why the haste? You know, because we know that even the correctional facility guys, the correctional service guys, are not well cared care, care for. It is, the, it is the big defendants, big, big uh, Inmate. uh, inmates who, who take care of some of the welf masters of welfare of uh, warders, of prison officials, of correctional uh, service officials. So this is unfortunate. It just shows that our elite in Nigeria have not, the elite has not given decent treatment to the justice sector. Justice sector is not just about judges. You know, we need to look up into that because this sector is not political, must not be political. Our former, uh, their former, their former, uh, our former president, President Olusha Gobasanjo, came from prison to become the president of Nigeria. Well, I would have, you know, came from prison to become the president of Nigeria. In other words, anybody can go to prison. So why don't we pay decent attention to the justice 
look, look at the police, for example. We, we have so many issues with the police. The police remains the weak link, one yeah. of the weakest links of the criminal justice system. I know the new IG is trying to do things, but we are yet to, feel, to see the impact after over almost 100 days of this administration. Because we are still having cases of missing of uh, case files. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. Files. oh, yeah. Are we funding the, the, the police stations? When suspects go to police stations now, they have to pay before a file is open. And then you have to pay it for investigation. That means the poor will have no access to justice. So right. democracy without access to justice is a non-starter. You know, Prof, this brings us back to the rule of law, which is what this is about. Yeah. And um, if a nation must succeed, you know, we're talking about prosperity now and good governance to thrive, then that rule of law must be respected. Absolutely. And engendering public trust, you know, requires institutional reforms that are in line with statutory laws. That's right. And these laws, most of the time, you've, we've, you've pointed out scenarios of abuse of power and the rest of it. The whole essence is to start preferring solutions to some yeah, of these um, anomalies. Yes. Where do we begin to draw the line? Because we can't keep having these conversations yes. over and over again. We talk about reforms. It's beyond, it's known, it shouldn't be about talk. Let, let me tell you, the, we have made progress. That's what you want, I, I guess that's yes. what you're talking about. We've made progress. For example, before 2015, Nigeria could not successfully try high profile defendants because the law was poor, the law was bad. So the Administration of Criminal Justice Act was passed in 2015. Kudos to the President Goodluck Jonathan administration. Mm -hmm. He gave Nigeria the Administration of Criminal Justice Act. You know, we give him kudos for that with the support of his Attorney General, Mohamed Bilo Adoki. Now, after that administration, the President Mohamed Bugari administration came, he started implementing it. Buhari left and gave Nigeria Process of Crime Act 2022. Mm. You know? So, in other words, we are making progress slowly, and that's what democracy is all about. I, I like the fact you're mentioning some of these laws. Oh, yes. Uh, we have the laws. Nigeria is good with laws. Yes. Are we but implementing implementation. Them? That, is, that is the challenge, and that's why I'm, I'm challenging the current government that it's not about making new laws. It's not about what we have a lot of laws that are in need of implementation. So, we need to take an audit of the laws that impact on democracy, the laws that impact on economic governance, the laws that impact on security. And then why are we, how are we take stock of our implementation of these laws? I think for me, that's the priority of the current administration. The job of the current attorney general is well cut out. It's not about reinventing the wheel. There are a lot of laws on our shelves begging for implementation. Let's take them one by one. Process of Crime Act, Administration of Criminal Justice Act, you know, Anti-Money Laundry Act, you know, Companies and Allied Matters Act. There are lots of provisions in these laws that are not being implemented. So I plead, I plead with the, with the justice sector, with the leaders of the justice sector, those who are currently in charge of the justice sector, to begin to ask questions, to begin to implement. Hmm. I, I, share, I share your views that we have the laws. But having um, the laws is one thing. Implementing them is another thing. The issue of terrorism financing also is very, very important yes, now yes what is being done about that because i remember an act yes was also passed recently on the issue 2022 yes precisely. yes terrorism financing anti money laundry process of crime these three laws were passed in 2022 you know and they are begging for implementation there are regulations that should be made for example regulations for managing assets that are recovered we don't, the regulations are not yet in place. They are to be issued by the Office of the Honorable Attorney General, you know. And I believe work is all going on that in the Ministry of Justice. You know, there are a lot of, in fact, the Ministry of Justice has a big role to play in the economic recovery, in the securing the country, because all, every, every, every aspect of the country, every aspect of democracy has one law the other governing it, you know. But these laws are there, begging for implementation. So I think the stage we have reached and one way this administration can demonstrate to Nigerians that they are different from the past is to prioritize implementation of laws. Mm -hmm. you know, and that should begin with an audit. Let us select, for example, federal character laws. We only apply our federal character law at the federal level. What about, there are provisions in the Federal Character Act which talks about inclusion at the, as, as the state levels. Nobody is paying attention to that. Okay, uh, yes. it's good, um, this timing is perfect because of the NBN conference. Yes. And 
the, the theme for me is really captivating. Absolutely. It says um, getting it right. Getting it Chatting right. Chatting, of course, yeah. for Nigeria's nation. Fantastic theme. You know, fantastic Showing the theme. concern of the leadership of the NBA. Yes. So whatever the NBA decides yes. will still trickle down to that common Nigerian. That's right. And it's good. No, no, that I mean that NBA yes. has spoken the mind of Nigerians, of Nigerians. Yes. that we yes. need to get it right. Yes, this going time around. Going forward. Yes, yes. and we, you, you could sense the body language of the president there when the, the opening of the conference. Yes. He, he wants to see that performance yes. index yes. this time around, yes. beyond talk. Yes. And if we're talking about getting it right, yes. it goes. You know, it involves stakeholders' engagement. Yes. It talks about an advocacy. And I like the fact that the direction, it's hinged on economy, security, and administration of justice. Absolutely. So if, we, if we're saying we want to get it right, Prof, where should we begin to look at? You have mentioned a lot of salient points. Yes. Um, going by the theme for this year now, getting it right. Getting it right. You see, the, we have been saying the right things. We need to start to do the right thing. Exactly. We need to make the impact of government felt, first and foremost, in every nook and cranny of Nigeria. The impact of government, access to justice, security, and economic opportunities. Yeah. And Nigerians are not lazy people, but they are looking for enabling environment, environment to, to be able to work. Exactly. Farmers yeah. want to go back to their farms. Fishermen want to fish. You know, look, our development, our development economics should be capital, should be uh, uh, labor intensive hmm. because we don't have the funds. You know, we cannot afford to use the same development strategies of the past the money is not there now but yeah. nigerians are, are ready to work but is the environment conducive now we have that you know, wish there's no in the past buses night buses used to travel i remember there was a time i used to travel by night bus as a struggling young man i would travel from ibadan to abuja over the, over the night and by the next morning i'm, I'm back in ibadan, ibadan to do my job my work as a young lecturer but now can we travel at night we cannot. We cannot. So I, I, I'm happy the government has placed emphasis on security. They have placed emphasis on uh, rule of law. They have placed emphasis on, on economy. But all of these things, all of these things are centered, must be centered on a people-oriented implementation policy, yeah. which will engage Nigerians. Government cannot deliver most of these things if Nigerians are not engaged. There are many, look, look. I mean, we're talking about big contractors. Every contract goes to Julius Berger and so on. How many Nigerians can Julius Berger engage? I don't mind. Give them the most difficult projects. But what about the arterial roads? What about bridges and culverts? Hmm. We, can, we need to put in place community development laws that will engage every street to participate in their own development. Yeah. Young boys, graduates, non-graduates, school, school start leavers. Leavers, all of them, many of them are roaming the street doing nothing. So we need a development policy which, which, which we call community development law, grassroots development law, which will, be, which will be crafted as quickly as possible so that when local communities, um, streets are, are organized to conduct uh, environmental protection, to protect themselves, of course, to network, then we also talk about community policing. There's a law on community police, a police act. We are not implementing it. The Nigerian Police Trust Fund should be at the centerpiece of community implementation of community policing. Yeah. Hmm. You know, so that community organizations link up with the Nigerian police. So that they can, people can protect themselves. People can contribute to their own development. We need to, to challenge the economic program, uh, policies of the previous government. They did not deliver they did not deliver to the, pop, to the poor people. The rich are getting richer, and the poorer are getting poorer. And if we continue to do that, democracy will not be sustainable. OK, so, but, yes. uh, but Prof, let me yes. take you from there. Uh, the uh, Constitution is the bedrock of yes. all that we have been discussing. Th that's things. right. Hmm. Do you think we need any serious amendments in our Constitution as it is now? Because if you hear people talking about lack of local government autonomy, it's why we have poverty. Serious poverty. In Our the local constitution government is fine. It's not perfect. Look, laws can never implement themselves, no matter how beautiful they are. You need good people to implement, even even to implement laws. Bad laws can be made can be made good through good implementation. 
You talk about local, lack of local government autonomy. Now, community development areas have been, have been, have been uh, created, even though they are not expressly mentioned in the Constitution. So it's not about, it's not about changing laws. Yeah. It's about changing attitudes, changing hearts, recognizing that when the poor people are not happy, even the rich cannot enjoy their money. So we need to, there, there must be a close, there must be making, we must consciously embark on people-oriented projects that would make the impact of government felt at the local level. We must connect with Nigerians in the diaspora who are concerned, who are, some, some are even afraid to come home. Why do our young people continue to flock overseas under very dangerous conditions? It's not because they don't want to stay in Nigeria. It's because the opportunities are not there. So government must be about provision of opportunities. And there are ways we can, we, we can organize our laws. We can organize our society so that we become more relevant to the needs of the masses of this country. Part of the recommendations over time we have heard from experts will be um, Persecutional reform, um, support for human rights, protection yes. of that right, yes. and sustaining it, and also preservation of the sacredness to the rule of law. What are your recommendations, Prof? Thank you. Thank you very much. Three things I will suggest quickly. One, prevention of looting of resources. Prevention of corruption must be prioritized. We must deploy all the resources that we have to ensure to, to, the economy is bleeding. When people have access to the resources and then, and then misappropriate it, that's number one. Secondly, we need to strengthen accountability institutions. We need to strengthen accountability institutions. And that includes the judiciary, the law enforcement agencies. Because if you don't get law enforcement right, if we don't get you know, law enforcement right, we don't get uh, judiciary right, nothing, nothing else will be right. Mm -hmm. If the justice system is not right, if the law enforcement system is not right, if the anti-corruption system is not right, if the accountability mechanisms cannot work, there's no economic system that will, that, will, that will help us. No economic system will help us. Because as we are trying to progress the country, some people are, dis are damaging the pipelines and they are not held accountable. Some people are looting. They are, they, are, they, are, they are stealing the oil, oil, oil. Nobody, they are not held accountable. All we are hearing is that we are bombing, uh, we are bombing uh, um, vessels. And then nobody is arrested, nobody is held accountable. Are, there not, are those vessels uh, operating themselves? No. And, and there are people, people who are, who, are, who, are, who are manipulating the foreign exchange market, making sure that government policies cannot, cannot mm. impact positively on the public because our accountability mechanisms is weak. So. A democracy without discipline, democracy without accountability, cannot be sustained. So that's why the long and short of it is get back to the justice system, get back to the security system, get back to effective law enforcement. Let there be fear of the of the of of of, of accountability. From your interface with uh, Ministry of Justice, yes. justice across the country, do you think uh, they are doing enough? Because recently the Chief Justice of Nigeria tax the attorney general that look they have to fast track the issue of uh, case files yes. because sometimes they accuse them of yes. not uh, doing enough yes what do you think is the they problem? can do much more they are doing well they have a lot of challenges but they can do much more and i'm aware that the federal minister of justice now is putting in place what they call a strategic plan wow. aimed at addressing some of their internal challenges you know which will reposition the ministry to be able to uh, deliver you know, more results, more economic results, more uh, social economic benefits to, Ni to Nigerians. You know, and I believe that if the Minister of Justice, you know, under the new attorney general, under the new leadership, is able to set the standards, and then they can, they, that can influence the states. Okay. That can, that can definitely be influence the states. The Minister of Federal Minister of Justice must set the standards for all the states in all segments of implementation of law. Prof, we have to round off. Yes. I just want a few words. Yes. Very brief. Yes. Your projection for the reforms you want to see in the justice. Yes, three things, as I said. You like number three, I Yes, prioritization <laughs> of accountability. So government needs to come out clearly. What is their policy on anti-corruption? 
Secondly, asset recovery, very, very critical. And then effective implementation of laws. And there are laws governing all sectors of the economy. Now, that is four. It's entering four. No, that's no, the first leave it there. Effective implementation of our <laughs> laws. There'll be part two of this discussion. <laughs> exactly. Thank you so yes. much, Professor Thank Yemi Akensheye George. Thank you. SAN. He's the president of the Center for Socio Legal Studies. Thank you very much for your time on platform. And we wish you the best in terms of your contributions to some of these reforms that we want to see happen Thank in you. the justice sector. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Our correspondent in the judiciary. Austin IMB, thank you so much for joining us on platform. Thank you for having me. Our pleasure. We've been discussing reforms in the justice sector and there's a whole lot that has been said about getting it right. We want to see a Nigeria where we have a sound intellectually um, judiciary and the bar, of course, where access to justice is affordable for everyone. That's, right. That's platform. I'm Ruth Aguila. Bye.